ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Honorable Ulama Ikram, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters, as Sheikh has introduced the topic to you, depression versus contentment. While the world continues to progress technologically, I swear by Allah, faster than its growth in technology, it is retrogressing morally and spiritually. We find ourselves being exposed to a society that has become so immoral, like Sayyidina Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu said, Ma'roofu zamanina munkaru zamanin qad madha wa munkaruhu ma'roofu zamanin lam ya'ti. Such deep words, food for thought. Sayyidina Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu said, Ma'roofu zamanina, the good of our times were the sins of the previous times. What you and I consider as noble, as pious, as righteous, was considered a sin, a vice, and transgression in the previous times. وَمَعْرُوفُ زَمَانِنَا مُنْكَرُ زَمَانٍ قَدْ مَضَى وَمُنْكَرُهُ مَعْرُوفُ زَمَانٍ لَمْ يَأْتِي And what we consider as vice and as evil and as wrong today will be considered noble and pious in the time that is to come. That is why in Bukhari there is one commentary where one Sahabi addressing his companion said, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْمَلُونَ أَعْمَالًا هِيَ أَدَقُّ فِي أَعْيُنِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ كُنَّا نَعُدُّهَا فِي عَهْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مِنَ الْمُوبِقَاتِ That, O oh my companions, I see you perpetrating many crimes which you trivialize. I swear by Allah, in the time of Nabi alayhi salam, these were considered as the most destructive crimes. And as we draw closer to Qiyamah, this continues. So while the world progresses definitely in technology, like one scholar mentioned, while the world boasts that now we are traveling by air, forgetting not that while we are now traveling by air, we have also polluted the air of Allah with guna. So in mud air, wine is being consumed, in mud air, zina is taking place. Indeed, there is growth and technology, but coupled with that is the retrogressing in, in morals and values. While life seems to become easier theoretically, in theory when you analyze life today, we have such advanced modes of transport, such easy ways of communication. In theory, life seems easier than previous times, but practically life has become more challenging than the previous times. Tension, depression and frustration has, wallah, become the order of the day. Happiness, joy and prosperity is something of the past. May I repeat what I said? Tension, depression and frustration has become the order of the day. Happiness, joy and prosperity has become something of the past. Never mind becoming a victim to any tragedy, which perhaps might warrant depression. A person met in an accident, lost a beloved, lost his wealth, lost a job. Some tragedy, some calamity, some catastrophe came in his way, which definitely warrants depression. Never mind the tragedies that, you know, a person becomes a victim to any tragedy. The very fears, the very fears that haunt the mind of an average man is sufficient depression. The very fears that haunt the mind of every individual that are ever lurking. Uh, I must never become poor. I must never be diagnosed of cancer. Uh, this must never happen. The fears that are ever lurking in the heart and the mind of every man is sufficient depression in the life of every person. You know, like the poet says, I wish you could understand Arabic. You can appreciate these couplets if you understand Arabic. He says, he presented in the surgery of a physician, سَأَلْتُ مِنَ الْأَطِبَّةِ خَبِيرًا ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ مِمَّ شَيْبِ سَأَلْتُ مِنَ الْأَطِبَّةِ خَبِيرًا ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ مِمَّ شَيْبِ فَقَالَ بَلْغَمُ فَقُلْتُ لَهُ عَلَى غَيْرِ احْتِشَامٍ لَقَدِ اخْتَأْتَ فِي مَا قُلْتَ بَلْغَمُ He says, I went to the doctor and I asked him, the doctor assessed me, I'm gone white. What is the reason? مِمَّ شَيْبِ like it comes in the authentic ahadith that Nabi alayhi salam said, uh, when Nabi alayhi salam was uh, told, Shibta ya Rasulullah, oh Nabi of Allah, you are aging, you are becoming white. Nabi alayhi salam said, Shayyabatni al-hudu wa akhawatuha. It is the frightening description of Qiyamah in Surah Hud, which makes my hair white. And we learn in the authentic ahadith that there were 20 strands of white hair on the blessed body of Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. And another poem comes to mind while I'm saying this here. The poet says, لَنَا خَدْتُمْ وَلِلْأَيَّامِ خَدْتُ لَنَا خَدْتُمْ وَلِلْأَيَّامِ خَدْتُ 
وبينهما مخالفة المداد فأكتبه سوادا في بياضي وتكتبه بياضا في سوادي I wish you can understand Arabic really you know it has to be understood in Arabic the time says the poet says I have a pen and the time has a pen the era in which we are living it has a pen and as we are talking our time is just moving away that is why Hassan Basri said regarding the Sahaba أدركت أقواما كان أحدهم أشح على عمره منه على درهمه that I sat in the company of Sahaba and I found them more possessive over their time than their wealth I found them they were more possessive they clinged on to that, that they were flexible with their money they were not hard on their money but they were very hard on their time nobody could take time from them أدركت أقواما كان أحدهم أشح على عمره منه على درهمه so the poet says, Lana khattun. I have a pen and the time has a pen. وَبَيْنَهُمَا مُخَالَفَةُ الْمِدَادِ The only difference is the ink. فَأَكْتُبُهُ سَوَادًا فِي بَيَاضِ My pen has black ink. I write with black ink on white paper. And the time writes with white ink on black hair. فَأَكْتُبُهُ سَوَادًا فِي بَيَاضِ وَتَكْتُبُهُ بَيَاضًا فِي سَوَادِ That is the difference. Nonetheless, he says, I asked the doctor, the doctor examined me, why am I gone white? So he said, Balghamu, you have a lot of phlegm in your body. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ احْتِشَامٍ لَقَدْ اِخْتَأْتَ فِي مَا قُلْتَ بَلْغَمُ Instantly I said, doctor, I respect your expertise. You need to understand Arabic to appreciate what has been said. I appreciate your expertise, but definitely I think this got nothing to do with phlegm. بَلْغَمُ Instead, this is depression. This is the result of depression in my body. This is what has happened. Tap any person, let him pour his heart out to you. Every man is in crisis. Inni ra'aytu kajalisam mustaqbili fa'alimtu annaka lilhumumi qareenu. Oh my brother, I seen you sitting before me. The very gesture of your face indicated depression. Hawin alayka wa kum bi rabbika wathiqa fa'akhut tawakkul sha'nuhu at-tahweenu. Take life easy, calm down, relax. As in Australia, they say, no worries. No worries. That's the term. I remember when we were there, I had to give a talk at a particular university. I met a man, he says, I asked him, where are you going? I said, I've got to go to the QUT, Queensland University of Technology. So, greet him, how are you? No worries. You go straight, you come to run about, you take a ride, you get in straight, you come. I didn't know what the man was saying. <laughs> no worries. Hawin alayk, relax, relax. Wa kum bi rabbika wa thiqa. And put your reliance on Allah. فَأَخُدْ تَوَكُّنِ شَأْنُهُ أَتَّهْوِينُ For verily the one that relies on Allah takes life easy. تَرَحَ الْأَذَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ فِي رِزْقِهِ لَمَّا تَيَقَّنَ أَنَّهُ مَذْمُونُ The only way to avert financial depression, the only way to avert and divert financial depression is to convince yourself that Allah is the sustainer. When you've convinced yourself that Allah is the sustainer, now the fluctuation in the currency, the fake predictions of the economists, the competitors in the market will not make a difference to you. So this is, this is the modern day poverty, if we can put it that way. That in the midst of affluence, there is no joy. In the midst of comfort and luxury, there is absolutely no joy. This is, this is the modern day poverty which stares at every person. And perhaps the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held the hand of Abu Dharr, and he said, Ya Abu Dharr, atara anna kathrat al-mal huwa al-ghina, wa qillat al-mal huwa al-faqr. Oh Abu Dharr, do you consider excess wealth, excess of provisions as wealth, and lack of provisions as poverty? I said, Oh Nabi of Allah, that is the apparent definition of wealth and poverty. That if you have a lot, you are successful, you are healthy, you are prosperous. And if you don't have, then you have a depressed life, you have a sick life. Nabi Ali Salaam said, no, no, Abu Zar, you have your facts muddled. Let me set the record correctly. As they say, just to put the record correctly. Nabi Ali Salaam then said in the rewrite of Ibn Hibban, إِنَّمَا الْغِنَى غِنَى الْقَلْبِ وَمَنْ كَانَ الْغِنَى فِي قَلْبِهِ فَلَا يَذُرُّهُ مَا لَقِيَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا No, Abu Zar, wealth in essence is the contentment of heart. Wealth in essence is the contentment of a heart and no, no Niagara Falls and no Victoria Falls can give you that contentment that is divine from Allah. وَمَنْ كَانَ الْغِنَى فِي قَلْبِهِ The one who has contentment in his heart فَلَا يَذُرُّهُ مَا لَقِيَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Then no amount of calamities and tragedies will harm this man, will depress this man. Nothing in this world will depress this man. 
You see, today every man has a different perception of contentment. Every person feels, some feel that if I get married and I have a beautiful wife, I have, that is the goal of my life. That is the aim, that is the ambition of my life. And I foresee my joy in that, in that woman. Others feel if I pursue a degree, I graduate, I earn so much, and then that is my particular accomplishment and that is the pinnacle of my joy. Like they say, four people were traveling. Or three people perhaps in a simple example, they were speaking different languages. One spoke English, one spoke Urdu, one spoke Arabic. Someone came and gave them a dollar. Now they had to split the dollar. What are they going to do with the dollar? The one that speaks Arabic, he said, Ana ashtari al-inab. Ana ashtari al-inab. I'm going to buy inab. Okay, the other one that speaks English, he said, no, no, I want to buy grapes. I want to buy grapes. I'm not buying inab. I'm buying grapes. The third one said, no, 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 I'm buying angur. I'm buying angur. He says, you know, I don't know what's your angur. I don't know what's your inab. I want my grapes. So then came along one person who spoke all three languages. Like, you know, they say, بِقَدْرِ لُغَاتِ الْمَرْءِ يَكْثُرُ نَفْعُهُ بِقَدْرِ لُغَاتِ الْمَرْءِ يَكْثُرُ نَفْعُهُ فَتِلْكَ لَهُ عِنْدَ الْمُلِمَّاتِ أَعْوَانُ فَبَادِرْ إِلَى حِفْظِ اللُّغَاتِ مُسَارِعًا فَكُلُّ لِسَانٍ فِي الْحَقِيقَةِ إِنْسَانُ That the more languages a person speaks, the better it is for him. So this person said, you know what, I will resolve your problems. You give me that one dollar and I will get your angur, your inab and your grapes for you. I'll do everything. He went, he bought a bunch of grapes and he came and gave it. He says, this is your angur, it is your grapes and it is your inab. So the expressions are different, but the common thing is peace. Every man is searching for happiness. Every person is searching for inner contentment. And wallah, Allah has not kept in the capacity of the things of this world. You take a child, you give him an item, he fences it for a period of time and the next day he is tired. Allah hasn't kept in the capacity of this world anything. In the capacity of this world to satisfy this restlessness of man, this crave of man, this ego of man. We continue with the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَنْ كَانَ الْفَقْرُ فِي قَلْبِهِ The one who has greed in his heart, the one who has contentment in his heart, nothing of this world, nothing. It is the perception that if you are healthy and you are wealthy, you are content. This is the deception and the delusion of the devil. Last year I had the opportunity to go to Malawi, which is the neighboring country from South Africa. The Quran Kareem was translated in the local vernacular language for the first time. And they had the launch of the Quran and there was the opening of the masjid. So some scholars were invited from South Africa. I was also amongst those that were invited. We were there at the launch of the Quran in the local language, in the vernacular language. Thereafter we visited many, many madaris and we were taken into some of the rural areas where literally people are living below the bread line. When I say below the bread line, in abject poverty, in literally abject poverty. We went to a particular location and this particular scene, you know, really caught my eye and I thought I related to you. There was a small little hut which was the house of this man. Safely I can say your laundry room is bigger than his entire house. Nearby there was a small well, there were some goats and some children were playing. It was extremely hot. There was no food, nothing, no fan, no aircon, nothing. This elderly aged man was sitting outside his particular hut in the heart of Africa, living in abject poverty. But that particular man had such a broad smile and he transmitted such warmth that I swear by Allah it left an indelible impression in my heart and my mind. And it left me thinking that really what is wealth and what is poverty? Who is wealthy and who is poor? Who is content and who is depressed? Few years ago we were in Jordan. We were hosted by a very very wealthy man. You know, subhanallah, Allah has given him such wealth. He filters his water 16 times before it comes out of the tap. He had spent in excess of 2 million US dollars on his garden. He received us at the airport, a breathtaking view, very scenic, mashallah. He owns more than 20 food outlets in the uh, United States. And you know, he received us and what a beautiful atmosphere. We performed Maghrib namaz on his lawn. It's on one of the high mountains of Amman. It was really an impressive scene. But the engrossment and the engagement of that male was such I did not cherish or admire or envy that man's wealth for a split second. And I kept on admiring the smile of this man living in abject poverty. What did the Nabi of Allah say? Woman kan al ghina fi qalbihi. He who has contentment in his heart, fala yadurruhu ma laqiya min ad dunya. No calamities of this world will depress him. You see, depression 
Fir'aun is sitting on his throne. The vision was sown. Someone seen the vision. Yuladu mauludun yadhabu mulkuka ala yadihi. That a child will be born and you will lose your kingdom at the hands of that child. The child is not yet born. Fir'aun is still governing. But scholars write from that day onwards, وَطَارَ نَوْمُهُ وَبَقِيَ فِرْعَوْنُ لَا يَطِيبُ لَهُ طَعَامًا وَلَا شَرَابٍ That was the end of food, drinks, happiness and joy. From that day onwards, imagine the child is not yet born. They haven't yet made the diagnosis of cancer. Doctors suspect there is cancer. That's the end of joy in the life of that man. How many people aren't they who own a lot of wealth? But because of sicknesses, they have such restrictions that the dog in that house eats better food than the owner. The man for breakfast has a very restricted diet. For lunch, he cannot have this, he cannot have that. The dog in that house eats better food. And this is what the world is chasing. This is what the world is advertising. This is what we have been brainwashed with and been exposed to. Look at that beautiful hadith in Bukhari Sharif. When there is contentment in the heart, food for thought in particular for our sisters. Ata ibn Abi Rubah says, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu tells me, Ala urika imra'atam min ahli al-jannah. Should I not show you a woman of jannah? I said, please do tell me. He said, هذه المرأة السوداء أتت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. You see this woman of Abyssinian origin? Come I tell you a story about this woman. She one day came to Nabi alayhi salam. Look at, look at the condition in her life. It does not mean when a man has contentment, when Allah has given him that calamities will not come. No, no, Allah will give him the strength to react differently. He will not get emotion by situ emotional by situations. Divinely Allah will inspire him and I will elaborate on what I'm saying. Money can buy you a house, like they say money can buy a house but not a home. Money can buy you a bed but not sleep. Person can be sleeping, you know, on water bed as they say. Insomnia is a medical condition that's only growing in the world, deprived of sleep. And on the other hand, there is a beggar, a pauper, sleeping under the tree in mud traffic. The people are driving, people are busy, engaged, and he's enjoying the divine sleep of Allah in the shade that Allah has provided. Wallahu ja'ala lakum mimma khalaqa zilala. He appreciates the shame that Allah has given and another man sitting in front of the ocean uh, having a beautiful view with his beloved wife on the third floor of that particular hotel and he's tossing and turning and he cannot sleep. Where is then pleasure coming from? Look at this particular woman. She comes to Nabi alayhi salam. Ya Rasulallah inni usra'u wa atakashaf. O Nabi of Allah, I suffer from epilepsy. Now what a fatal illness she is suffering. What is sickness? Now as the world harps upon it, that you know, if you are, there's so many anti-aging products. You mustn't age, you mustn't be sick. Uh, there are so many sisters that are destroying their health just to look thin, just to look attractive, seductive. That I must look thin, I must look appealing as this particular woman on this magazine and that magazine. Uh, because I am made to believe that if I look thin, sweet, attractive and seductive, then I am successful and I am content. Yet that particular pills is destroying that woman, she is suffering, she is deprived of food. You know, like they say, the typical American mentality of dropping the levels of obesity is going to a particular shop, can I have a double cheesy burger and a diet coke? <laughs> Why the levels of obesity are too high, so I'll have a diet coke with a double cheesy burger. So anyway, this woman comes to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulallah inni usra. Subhanallah, look at contentment. I swear by Allah, it comes divine from Allah. O Nabi of Allah, I suffer from epilepsy. And when I have these attacks, my satir is exposed. Could you perhaps make dua to Allah that Allah cures me? Now what a tragedy in a life. It warrants total depression. Subhanallah, what are the teachings of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The Nabi of Allah, one was to lift his hands and instantly make dua and Allah will respond positively and cure the woman. But the Nabi of Allah gave her a choice. In shi'ti da'utu Allah an yu'afiq. Wa in shi'ti sabarti walakil jannah. You have one of two choices. If you so wish, <laughs> I will make dua to Allah now. He will cure you instantly, permanently, totally. On the other hand, if you endure, persevere, and exercise patience, I promise you, Jannet is yours. 
Now in, in, in today's terms when a person understands that sickness means depression, it means uh, medical expenses, it means burdening the family, it, it entails a host of other things. Naturally a person is so desperate for cure, he'll do anything and everything. Another one, while I'm speaking about this, another hadith comes to mind. Aisha Fatima radiallahu anha comes home, she is hungry. Ali radiallahu anha is hungry. What the world has painted as depression, and what Islam tells us with regards to contentment. There is absolutely no food. Now a person is living in difficulty, is some financial problems. Again, this warrants depression. You find today most of the circular degrees that a person pursues is in relation to his monetary return. Most of the things, a person is becoming a doctor, very few are those whose aim and whose ambition is to serve humanity. It might be a sideline, uh, you know, option. But the primary reason, the priority in pursuing that particular is the monetary returns. What will I get back? By giving so much, how much do I get back? These are the reasons why, because why? The perception is the day I have wealth, I am successful and I'm content. I am happy the day I have wealth. That is the end of sadness, depression. And that's apart from the depression which is as a result of Quran, and I'm coming to that still. I swear by Allah, the greatest contributing factor to depression is guna. Ask that young boy who after he takes a pill and he's on a bus and he's on cloud nine and he's safe, you know, floating somewhere else. As soon as he becomes sober, he goes through such depression that he's left with one of two options. Either he commits suicide or takes a pill again. There's no other choice in the life of that young boy. I personally have dealt with many youth involved in drugs. Perhaps while perpetrating the crime, he enjoys fake pleasure. But no sooner he becomes sober, he goes through such depression. My Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, prophesizing the things of Qiyamah, a man will come to the grave, to the grave of his brother, not to respect the disease, not to come and convey thawab to him. Yatamarragu, he will then turn in the soil of the grave and he will say, Ya laytani kuntu makana sahiba hadha al-qabr. My brother, I envy you, you are gone. I promise you, I cannot bear the calamities of this world any longer. I wish I was beneath the soil and you were above the soil. In the midst of all the comforts that he has, Someone said, I wish, can you tell me someone is selling death? I want to buy death. I'm frustrated with life. I have come here with all the comforts, all the luxuries, all the affluence. Like in Urdu they say, Ab to gabara ke ye kehte hai ke mar jayenge, mar ke bhi chen na paaya to kidar jayenge. Now in a fit of frustration you say, I wish I die, I wish I die, I wish I die. And then they speak of euthanasia, mercy killings. Ab to gabara ke ye kehte hai ke mar jayenge. You take any youngster to a rehabilitation when he's been admitted in that particular rehab the first thing they ask him as the symptoms of drugs did the thought of suicide cross your mind that's among the first things this is nothing these antidepressant tablets you know they have antidepressant I give this example perhaps I share it with you it's nothing that is escapism you are hiding the reality you are disguising and camouflaging you are not solving you are not soothing you are not unwinding you are not relaxing it's like a person went to a particular motor mechanic he had a problem in his car he says you know what as i'm driving this is very strange and peculiar sound coming out and i can't trace the problem so the motor mechanic had a look at the car uh, but he couldn't trace the problem he says you know what i can't really find anything but i got a way out i can solve the problem for you if it really bothers you while driving, just put your radio a bit louder. <laughs> if the noise bothers you, just put your radio, and I promise you your problem will be solved without any money. I won't take a cent from you. You just turn the volume a bit louder and that's it. I swear by Allah, that is antidepressant tablets. You have solved no problem. You have only camouflaged it, you've disguised it. The problem remains. Become sober and it's worse than what it was. There is antidepressant tablets. The riwayat of Bayhaqi, Nabi alayhi salam said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah is the cure of 99 ailments, the least of which is depression. The least of which is depression. Inna sadaqat as-sir 
تُطْفِئُ غَذَبَ الرَّبِّ Let me complete that hadith. Fatima رضي الله عنها comes home. There is no food. Now what happens to a man today again? The perception is that when there isn't wealth, when there isn't food, when there's sickness, these things warrant depression. In western circles, what happened to people in this situation? So anyway, Ali رضي الله عنه tells Fatima رضي الله عنها that go to your father and ask him if there is some food. Fatima رضي الله عنها comes to the house of Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم. How did they react to situations? Sometimes it's just the change of attitude. It's not the change of condition, it's the change of attitude that brings pleasure to life. Fatima رضي الله عنها comes and knocks on the door. Umm Ayman رضي الله عنها is seated by Nabi alayhi salam. From the very tone of the knock, Nabi alayhi salam said, Inna hadha ladaqqu Fatima. This is my Fatima knocking at the door. وَلَقَدْ أَتَتْنَا فِي سَاعَةٍ مَا عَوَّدَتْنَا أَن تَأْتِينَا فِي مِثْلِهِ And my Fatima has come on a strange time. Normally my Fatima will not visit me on this time. Definitely there is something that is bothering my daughter. She enters the house of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which father wants to see his daughter coming home with hunger? And Allah forbid that don't happen if that comes and happens to her. How would we react to the situation? We will go through depression that I don't know what and where we will go. Look at how the Nabi of Allah reacts. Nabi alayhi salam, she sits down, she then praises Nabi alayhi salam, durood and salawat on the noble personality. And then, you know, she very, in a very subtle way, she indicates, in a very modest way, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hathi al-malaika, ta'amuha al-tahleel, wa tasbih wa tahmeed, fama ta'amuna. O Nabi of Allah, the angels glorify Allah perpetually, satisfy their needs by worshipping Allah, myself, your son-in-law, and your grandchildren have absolutely no food, could you perhaps make some arrangements? Do you know what an emotional meeting that is? Can any father contain himself? Allah, don't let, ever let that happen to us. To find your daughter coming in this way, to see your grandchildren hungry, the Nabi of Allah's eyes become moist. He comes into emotions. But he calms himself down, subhanallah. Divinely contentment. Allah inspires it. The Nabi of Allah says, O oh Fatima, and this is what the Nabi of Allah told that woman, and I want to mention, وَمَنْ كَانَ الْغِنَى فِي قَلْبِهِ The one who has contentment in his heart, no worldly condition will depress him. Conditions will come upon him. Conditions will come upon him. Like they say, having Allah on your side does not mean sailing on the ocean with no waves. It doesn't mean that. But having Allah on your side means sailing in such a ship which no storm can sink. That is what it means. It doesn't mean you will not have storms. You will have storms, you will have waves. But when you have Allah on your side, no storm will sink that ship. No storm will sink that ship. That is divine contentment that Allah will give. And nothing of the world can give you this. They have tried anything and everything to get that happiness. And in the end there's nothing. When the wealth of Persia came into Medina Munawwara, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu started crying. Abdurrahman ibn Awf said, Inna hadha layawm sururin. Awmir al-mu'mineen, wealth, affluence, prosperity. This is a day of triumph. This is a day of victory. This is a day of joy. Such wealth we anticipate Allah has given us. Why are you mourning when Allah is opening the days of victory? But look at the far sightedness of Umar. How deep his sight and how far his vision was. He said, Inna hadha al mal lam yu'tihi Allahu qawman illa alqa Allahu baynahum al ada wa tawal bagda. Study the history of affluence. What did Sayyidina Umar say? Study the history of affluence. Whenever it came to a nation, it divided them. Whenever it came to a nation, it snatched joy from them. It took inner happiness. There were times when one person was working and ten people were living and everybody was happy. Today ten people are working, end of the day not one is happy. End of the month not one is happy. This is the modern day poverty. In the midst of all comforts and luxuries, there is no happiness, there is no joy. The object of nikah is that when you look at your wife, it must put an end to depression and not start depression. <laughs> oh, 
وَالَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمْ The Quran says لِتَسْكُنُوا That when you come home and the spouses meet, that must be the end of depression. The fatigue, the frustration that the husband experienced throughout the day. The tiredness, the wife had an agenda, the children, the house, the domestic work, so many duties. Both had a long, tiring day that exhausted the respective partners. The Quran says the fundamental object of your marriage is that when you meet, it must put an end to depression. If you are meeting with your spouse and it is starting depression, I swear by Allah, even if you're living in, in a palace and in affluence, the very fundamental object of that marriage is forfeited. Allah says the object of your house is it must put an end to tiredness and fatigue. Today no man can sit at home. They just want to go out. Come we can run. Come holiday go. If your house, if your house can't give you comfort, then uh, better than that is a heart. The Quran says the object of your house is it must bring inner joy, inner satisfaction. That there's no bounds, no restrictions, no, pro no, no formalities. You can relax yourself. You can sit as you want to. You are free and at liberty. If your house cannot contain you, cannot attract you. In English they say the one that doesn't find joy at home will find it nowhere. The one that does not find joy at home will find it nowhere. So the Nabi of Allah then tells his daughter, O Fatima, if you want, I will give you five sheep which someone brought and gave to me. I give it to you. You take it home, slaughter it and eat it. And if you want, عَلَّمْتُكِ خَمْسَ كَلِمَاتٍ عَلَّمَنِيهِنَّ جِبْرِيلٍ or otherwise I teach you five words, five ayat, five du'as, which if you recite will soothe you, satisfy you, your hunger, your depression, your pain, your agony, today, tomorrow, when your father is around and when he's gone. We learn from these ahadith that there is a price for this divine joy. There was nothing wrong for the Nabi of Allah to say, yeah, my daughter, take the sheep also and take the du'as also. But he didn't do that. He said, take the sheep or the dua, one of the two. Bearing in mind, this is a father who sees his own daughter hungry. There is no words of any language that can translate the emotions of such a father. And Fatima, whom my Nabi loved the most. Man ahabbaha faqad ahabbani, wa man aadaha faqad aadani. Whoever loves my Fatima loves me, whoever dislikes my Fatima dislikes me. Hassan and Hussein, the coolness of my eyes. She said, O Nabi of Allah, I will prefer those five words. I will prefer it. Nabi alayhi salam says, Okay, then say after me, O oh my daughter, Ya awwal al awwaleen, wa ya akhir al akhareen, wa ya rahim al masakeen, ya dal quwwat al mateen, ya arham al rahimeen. She takes this, she reads this, she goes home, she returns to her husband. Imagine your wife sending you with a shopping list and you come back with a dua. <laughs> Never mind, you know, you just come back with a different item and you know what happens. You know, like they say, this particular woman, she came home, her husband, he brought tomatoes for his wife, came and he left it there in a packet. She says, no, I don't want this one. I want the one in the box, man, the one in the wooden box. He said, oh, okay, no problem. He went outside. He found a wooden box, took it, put the tomatoes inside, knocked some nails, brought it home. He says, yeah, this is the one I wanted. <laughs> anyway, she comes with dua. Now what I'm saying, these are situations that bring depression to us. I don't know, has the tragedies of our times become more, or has our forbearance levels dropped more? Petty, petty things today, trivial things, a man goes through depression. And immediately, you know, he needs to do this, he needs to go, you know, he's back onto his drugs, he's doing this, he's doing... Trivial, trivial things and a person cannot contain himself. Petty issues and a man is divorcing his wife. And subhanallah, look at this condition, husband, wife and children, all are hungry. She comes home, she reads the duas to her husband, the husband is happy. The children, they soothe the children, the children are too young, too tender to fathom, to appreciate. But how Allah gave... Contentment to Fatima through this dua, Fatima's hunger was the price of this contentment. 
I said it on a full stomach, my brother, you heard it on a full stomach. Neither I can appreciate what this dua can do, neither you can appreciate. I and you both will have to collectively knock the door of Fatima to understand the hidden tranquility that Allah has kept in this dua. Neither I nor you, the tranquility that Allah has kept and how soothing this dua is, that we'll have to ask Fatima, her hunger and the hunger of her husband and her children collectively was the result of the divine tranquility that Allah provided to her. Like they say, this person was sitting and relaxing. So someone said, get up and do something good in your life, man. What are you wasting your life for? He said, what must, I, what must I do? He says, go work and make some money, man. And then get married. And then, well, you can perhaps go for a vacation. And then what? Sit by the beach and relax. He said, well, I'm doing that now. <laughs> I'm doing that now. Why must I go through all those procedures? Must I go through five procedures? I'm relaxing now. In analam afuz bi muradi sa'yin. وَكَمْ مِنْ حَسْرَةٍ تَحْتَ التُرَابِ If I did not accomplish my material goal in life, what's the harm? You died as a doctor, I died as an ignorant man. But then we entered through one door. Well, what's the first? Well, you made it, well and good. I didn't make it, well, what's the difference? End of the door, day, who is happy in his life? Who has divine happiness and joy? Do some soul searching and ask yourself, the Nabi of Allah asked this woman, if you want, I make dua to Allah, Allah will cure you. And if you want, you make sabr and jannah. Now she is suffering epilepsy. Subhanallah, contentment. She says, oh Nabi of Allah, if you promise that I have patience, jannah is mine, then I will prefer living with this sickness. And I will prefer dying with this sickness. As long as you can confirm jannah is mine. However, I am very conscious of my modesty. And when I have my epilepsy attacks, my sitter is unveiled and it is exposed. I want you to make that amount of dua that in the future attacks that I have, I, my sitter mustn't be unveiled. There was a time when a woman was conscious of her morality in the midst of sickness, which perhaps anyone can dis, you know, debate as she been excused in the sense of the sickness that she has. The Nabi of Allah made dua that in the future attacks that she has, her sitter mustn't be exposed. But Allah gave her contentment on her sickness. Allah gave her contentment on her sickness. She lived with epilepsy, she died with epilepsy. And on the tongue of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, her abode in Jannat was confirmed. Hence it is a perception, it is a deception, it is a delusion. That if I am healthy and I am wealthy, I am successful and I am content. It is contentment. Grab onto it, I swear by Allah, if you have it, you're a king without a throne also. And look at those who own the entire world. Those who own the entire world. Those that went, they all went in the same way, nothing more. Like in, in, in Arabic, they say, لا تتفكر في ثلاثة أشياء. Don't think about three things, this will add to your depression. This is the formula of depression. This is the formula of getting depressed. And today, inevitably, every man has this in his mind. Don't think about the day I won't have money. The day I lose my job. The day this happens to me. Don't, don't plan. Or don't, don't, don't uh, you know, fear. Don't sit in, uh, you know, Think about the moments where I won't have wealth. Why? This will only increase your greed and it will add to your anxiety and it will multiply your depression. Number, number two, لا تتفكر في طول البقاء Do not plan a long future in life. Allah alone knows the destiny of every man. But if a person plans a long future, then he will have to amass much more because he'll say at the age of 70 I need this, at 80 I need this, at 90 I'll need this because I'm around till 100. Like to ammilu fi dunya, you know these couplets are so beautiful. To ammilu fi dunya tawil wa la tadri idha janna laylun hal ta'ishu ila al-fajri. Fakam min sahihin mata min ghayri illatin wa kam min alilin aasha dahran ila dahri. وَكَمْ مِنْ فَتَنْ يُمْسِي وَيُسْبِحُ آمِنًا وَقَدْ نُسِجَتْ أَكْفَانُهُ وَهُوَ لَا يَدْرِي To أَمِّلُ فِي الدُّنْيَا الطَّوِيلِ Oh my brother, you are very ambitious in this world. Yet when the night sets in, you don't know if you will see dawn or not. 
ولا تدري اذا جن ليل هل تعيش الى الفجر فكم من صحيح مات من غير علا there are so many healthy people who died without any apparent reason وكم من عليل عاش دهرا الى دهري and there are so many people who are fatally ill yet loved for decades وكم من فتى يمسي ويصبح امنا وقد نسجت اكفانه وهو لا يدري and there are so many youth so the concluding couplets there are so many youth who live in comfort and affluence knowing not that this, the coffin in which he will be wrapped has been prepared and the hole in which he will be lowered has been dug وكم من فتى he gets up proud and arrogant knowing not that my grave has been dug at this moment so do not plan a long future Allah alone knows this will add to your depression as I was mentioning brothers the greatest contributing factor to depression Allah's qasam is guna there is nothing that will depress a man more than sin Nabi alayhi salam says in the hadith inna sidqa tamanina today we find a person we are living in such a uh, promiscuous society such promiscuity it is inconceivable I was listening to a radio program back home in South Africa and they were talking about you know having an affair with strange woman and this particular I don't know if you can call him a human but anyway he phones in and he speaks about his experiences and he says well I had relation with a thousand women people actually started calculating his age and you know they even made a joke and they said I think you possess a weapon of mass destruction <laughs> that is a weapon of mass destruction a thousand women such a promiscuous society we are living in and there is no joy Allah's qasam the greatest thing is sin Nabi alayhi salam said inna sidqa tamanina listen to the words of Nabi alayhi salam honesty provides tranquility honesty in your dealings, in your interaction, provides divine happiness, joy, satisfaction. Now extend the realms of that hadith, broaden the scope of that hadith. Let's extend, the, extend the, 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 the explanation, explore that hadith. Honesty, piety, integrity, loyalty, fidelity provides divine happiness, joy and satisfaction. And Nabi alayhi salam says lies, sin, vice provides restlessness uneasiness, depression, frustration, ask a man pursuing an unlawful relation and my wife mustn't get hold of my phone whoever is at the door run quickly I better see who's coming he's constantly he's, he's, he's on his nerves all the time nobody must come to know my wrong the, 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 the depression that, he, that results out of that sin the nature of the devil is and, and this in particular I want to address to my youth the Quran speaks about this here that when the devil provokes a person towards a sin and he paints the picture that you make zina and you will be happy you take the spill and that will be the end of pain in your life and you know that is it كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ اكْفُرْ كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ اكْفُرْ فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ فَكَانَ عَاقِبَتَهُمَا أَنَّهُمَا فِي النَّارِ خَالِدَيْنِ فِيهَا وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الظَّالِمِينَ The similitude of the devil when he incites and provokes you to a sin. Now when a devil provokes you to a sin, then he plans the sin for you. He also answers all the perhaps the, the, the possible leakouts of the sin. That if you come late, what you'll tell your wife? No, no, you can tell her you got delayed at work. On the way, if this happened, all the apparent falls and loopholes that perhaps could be a setback the devil answers everything instantly the mind is running the mind is running the devil is flowing the sin is vivid before him he's got a choice either he does it or not it, it looks very tempting very appealing very convincing very you know if I do it this is this is what I actually need in my life it will be the end of this depression and tiredness and fatigue and whatever else as it is a beautiful massage you know by, by gentle hands what more do I need so the devil provokes him up and the devil says do it and I'm with you all the way and look here after all when the brothers of Yusuf 
intended killing Yusuf. And then immediately at that time, and I'm going to tell you something very important. Listen to what I got to say, brothers. At that particular moment, the devil told them, وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ that you commit this act, you kill your brother out of jealousy. Out of jealousy, kill your brother, get rid of him. The focus of your father will then be exclusive on you. And after the sin, after all Allah is forgiving, if you won't commit sins, who will Allah forgive? Scholars explain to think of the mercy of Allah prior to committing a sin. To think of the mercy of Allah prior to committing a sin is like saying, burn yourself. I've got an ointment for burnt fingers, so burn yourself. I, I, I bought this ointment. If I'm not going to burn myself, who's going to use this ointment? So let me burn myself. Let me burn myself. I mean, I bought it here in case something happens, so let me burn. That is not the time to reflect on the mercy of Allah. Scholars explain if a person ponders over the mercy and the forgiveness, the kindness and the tolerance, the respite and the clemency of Allah, prior to perpetrating a sin, his minor sin will become a major sin. That is what will happen. Oh, my Allah is so forgiving, I don't need to just look at this woman, I can have zina with her. When my Allah can forgive so much, let me satisfy myself totally. That is not the time to look at how merciful Allah is. After you have perpetrated, and for some reason or the other, we are humans, we succumb to the evil forces within us. At times it happens, we do succumb. We give in. We don't know why we commit in it, why we perpetrate in it. But for some reason we succumb to that evil force. After this, and yes, reflect over the mercy of Allah. Do not despair. But never to think of the mercy of Allah prior to committing a sin. That's not the time. So the devil plans everything and he reminds you of how forgiving Allah is also. And he promises you do this. Falamma kafar. Falamma kafar. When you make kufar, when you make zina, when you take that pill, and after you become sober, such depression engulfs your heart. What does the Quran say? وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا The support, the encouragement, the, the, the person standing with you and provoking you with the devil. As soon as you perpetrate, he withdraws. The Quran says, خَنَّاس مِن شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاس خَنَّاس Oh Allah, I seek your evil from the sneaking whisperer. Who comes, sneaks, withdraws, sneaks, withdraws. So after you've perpetrated the crime, he withdraws totally. I'm not with you. Now you do what you... Inni akhafullah, I got nothing to do with you. Now you, tough luck to you, my friend. You did it, you suffer it. The only way I can join you again is if you go back to that woman. If you take the pill again, I stand with you. Hence, you will see a person committed a crime to satisfy himself. One after the other, he went deeper and deeper, deeper. You know, like they have that bungee jumping, you flow one way. He goes deeper and deeper into that sin and there's no way he's coming back. Life looks so dark for him, there's no way out. In the battle of Badr, Shaitan came to Abu Sufyan in the form of Suraka as the leader of the tribe of Kinana and he told him وَإِذَا زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ وَعَمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارٌ لَكُمْ I am with you. Don't worry. I will support you. I will encourage you. I will help you. You will defeat the Muslims. فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَتِ الْفِئَتَانِ But when reality stared and the two armies met with one another نَكَسَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ As is the nature of the devil, he withdraws and he fled the battle. So Abu Sufyan asked him, O oh, Suraka, where are you? You promised me, you encouraged me, you motivated me. قَالَ إِنِّي What did he say? نَكَسَ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ وَقَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكُمْ إِنِّي أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ No, no, I can see divine angels coming. I've got nothing. You involved, you, su you suffer the consequences. So that is the result of depression that will come as guna. It will never come to an end. And scholars write, worse than that sin is four things. أَرْبَعٌ بَعْدَ الذَّنْبِ شَرٌ مِّنَ الذَّنْبِ الْإِسْتِصْغَارِ وَالْإِسْتِبْشَارِ وَالْإِغْرَارِ 
After committing that sin, to consider it as trivial is worse than the sin. After committing the sin, to rejoice over the sin. That you rejoice over the calamity you have done, over the sin you've perpetrated. Nabi alayhi salam says in the hadith, Kullu ummati mu'afan illa al-mujahireen. Allah is prepared to forgive every person with the exception of those that sin openly. With the exception of those that sin openly. And amongst those that are guilty of sinning openly are people who sin by night secretly. They sin by night, وَقَدْ بَاتَ يَسْتُرُهُ رَبُّهُ And Allah conceals the man's sin. He does a sin, commits zina, takes a pill, does whatever wrong. And then in the morning he gets up and he doesn't rest until he doesn't unveil the veil of Allah. And he goes and says, I enjoyed this woman and I had this wine to bring this pleasure. Such a man has committed a crime which is unpardonable in the eyes of Allah. So contentment comes from Allah. It comes on the obedience of Allah. Let me explain to you the incident. I don't know what is my time allocation. I think I just got to worry about my flight and that's about it. But anyway, <laughs> let me explain to you an incident. When Allah wants to give peace in the battle of Uhud, you see, it's got nothing to do with wealth. It's got nothing to do with health. In fact, the ayah that I recited that I really want to explore, we haven't started. And that is what Allah says, whoever will obey Allah, Allah promises a good life. What is the definition of a good life? It's the perception that it's a healthy and a wealthy life. Let's define. Let's have a common definition of a good life. And on the other hand, Allah says, whoever disobeys Allah, Allah will give him a narrowed life. The apparent life that the kuffar have is wealth, affluence, comfort, fame, luxury. And yet the Quran says every kafir has a narrowed life. And the believers, Allah say, those who obey Allah, they will have a good life. The most deserving for this good life is the galaxy of the prophets and the noble companions of Nabi alayhi salam. Because the quality of iman and amal salihah was found in them to the highest extent. Nobody could have this more than them. And hence, we do not find health and wealth common amongst all the prophets. At times, perhaps it could define a good life, but it doesn't necessarily entail the total definition of a good life. Perhaps Allah gives it to some. Allah gave it to Sulaiman alayhi salam. What a kingdom, what a dominion, what a vast empire Allah had given him. Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu was salam. Scholars write two things define a good life and a content. This is the definition of a good life which Allah promises. The first is that whatever situation comes in your life, Allah gives you the ability to focus on the reward promise in that challenge in Akhirah. What does Allah give you? That this condition has come upon you like I spoke about Fatima, I spoke about Radiallahu anha and that woman. A challenge comes on you, the definition of a good life is Allah enables you, Allah empowers you, Allah enriches you. This is not something that I can say or you can purchase. This is divinely inspired. Allah enables you to focus. That this is the challenge, this is the calamity, this is on me in my life. This is what my Allah has kept for me in Akhirah. And the second thing that defines a good life is that Allah gives you contentment. Now let's just briefly run through the life of Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah had given him health, wealth, comfort, luxury, affluence. You name it and he had it. 80 years of total prosperity. Thereafter, Allah decided to test him. Allah tested him in such a way, Allah took everything. Allah took all his farms, all his orchards, everything burnt away. The roof of his house, and this is authentic narrations, the roof of his house collapsed, causing all the occupants of his house, that were his 14 children, to die instantly. A person loses one child and never recovers. The trauma of it never recovers. He or she is never the same human onwards. Fourteen children he loses at one instance. He loses all his farms and that's not all. He develops such a sickness that he has ulcers on his entire body. The only pillar of support that he had was his wife. And as I mentioned, the fundamental object of marriage is to put an end to depression and not to start depression. The Quran says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا The primary reason behind marriage is that it puts an end to depression, it puts happiness, joy, solace and bliss. And by, by, by virtue of the bond of marriage, Allah promises too, love and mercy, love and mercy. 
بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Scholars write, generally love translates itself in the initial stages of the marriage. قِيلَ الْمَوَدَّةً لِلشَّابَّ وَالرَّحْمَةً لِلْعَجُوزِ And mercy for the respective partners uh, often translates in the latter part of the marriage. In the initial stages it's more motivated by love and lust. So anyway, the pillar of support for him was his wife. His wife was the granddaughter of Yusuf alayhi salam. وَقَدْ رَافَقَتْ هَذِهِ الْمَرْأَةُ حَيَاتَ نِعْمَتِهِ وَصِحَّتِهِ وَزَمَنَ بُؤْسِهِ وَبَلَائِهِ فَكَانَتْ فِي الْحَالَيْنِ مَعَ زَوْجِهَا شَاكِرَةً صَابِرَةً This woman seen the error of prosperity. When things are good, then the partner says, Oh, wonderful husband, wonderful. What more to complain? Why? Because life is prosperous, everything is going well. But when difficulties comes, when challenges sets in, now this is the time to support your partner. More than often in western circles, these marriages dissolve. Why? Because they are challenges. But look at through this bond. When Allah gives contentment in the midst of difficulties, what joy there is. Like, I must, subhanallah, you know, they say in Arabic, Ahlu layli fi laylihim aladhu min ahli lahwi fi lahwihim. Ahlu layli fi laylihim aladhu. Allah's qasam. The joy that people derive in disturbing their sleep in disturbing their sleep and making wuzu in cold water and enjoying the privilege of communicating with Allah in the dead of night is much greater and much more than that young boy who's sitting on the lap of a beautiful seductive strange woman in the heart of a club with a bottle of wine in his hand my brother you have tasted the fake pleasure you've seen how it has deceived you I call you in this gathering and I invite you and I implore you I introduce you to divine pleasure. I introduce you to spiritual pleasure. Wallah, there is such pleasure in salah. A time may Allah favor you with it, one and all. <coughs> that, that moment comes in your life, Allah's qasam. I don't want to sit and, you know, it's, it's not something I want to mention. Where you will go in sajda. And I promise you, you will derive such pleasure. Allah's qasam in his control is my life. You won't able to lift your head up. May Allah give it to you, say Ameen. I promise you brothers, I can tear and say it. There are those moments which Allah gives. Rajulun dhakar Allah khaliya. You know, one is you crave for a woman, you crave for a pill, you crave for a sin, and one is you crave for Allah. It's not even a correct term and phrase to use. You know, it, it has filthy connotations, crave. But you love Allah, and you sit in sajda, and, and you feel the presence of your Allah, and you feel that closeness to Allah, that you, Wallah, I swear by Allah, you can't lift your head up. You, you just cannot. It, it's like you, you're stuck. There's something between you and your Creator. You'll forget that fake pleasure. Ahlu layli fi laylihim. Aladhu min ahli lahwi fi lahwihim. It comes in the hasha of Tafsir Uthmani, this quotation. That the joy of those that obey Allah and their pleasure. Uh, Muha Imam Yusuf Rahmatullah used to say, if the kings knew the pleasure we got in reading kitab, they would throw their kingdom and they would study kitabs. They would abandon, you know, I often have this and I, I share this as a sense of joy. When you study in a kitab at times till late and you come across some new, new point, some new hadith, something that you could perhaps convey, it's such joy. I, I can't, ex I, I don't know how to express it. A way you, you've discovered a new point, a new tafsir, a new commentary. You've arrived at a new conclusion. And it's in the midnight and everyone is sleeping. And subhanallah, you come to a conclusion and you, you, you know, deduce some point. It is a pleasure which I cannot translate in words. So what happens to Ayyub alayhi salam? The pillar of support was his wife. And she stands by his side. She stood in the days of prosperity as, the, as well as the days of difficulty. But as life continued, seven years of difficulty, Ayyub alayhi salam, the sickness took a toll on her. We often sympathize on a person that is sick. We forget to sympathize with those living with a sick person. At times they need more sympathy than the sick person. What about those that are living with a sick person? So it started taking a toll on her. Seven years lapsed. She comes to her husband. She says, don't you think it's high time you make dua to Allah that now he cures you and you know once again restores your health. And we can see prosperity again. The tunnel is dark, it's raining, it's pouring. Life is narrowing upon us. Don't you think perhaps if Allah can open up things in our life and we have a more brighter future. But this is a Nabi of Allah. He asked his wife, 
كم لبثت في الرخاء Oh my wife, how long did we enjoy health and prosperity? So she said, 80 years, eight decades. Kam labithtu fil bala? How long did we live in difficulty and how long am I sick and how long is it since we lost our children? So she said, it's seven years if I recall correct since this difficulties came in our life. So Sayyidina Ayyub said, Ama astahi an atlub min Allahi raf'a balai wa ma qadaytu fihi muddata rakhai. I feel ashamed. That when my Allah has given me 80 years of prosperity and my Allah has only tested me for seven years, I don't have the guts, nor do I think my situation justifies me asking Allah. 80 years of prosperity, if Allah tests me with difficulty for 80 years and my days of adversity is in proportion to my days of prosperity, then perhaps I will take the courage of asking Allah. But until 80 years don't lapse, I'm not going to make an attempt to ask Allah. In the midst of sickness, but he's content. He is totally happy. This divine happiness. You know, in the battle of Uhud, Nabi alayhi salatu was salam had posted 50 archers. And he told them, You guard that mountain. Right? 50 archers. And the Sahaba were moving in the battle. And Allah Ta'ala was giving them victory. And as Allah was giving them victory, these 50 Sahaba felt that, well, everybody is engaged in the spoils of the war. Let us also go for the spoils of the war. And they shifted from the command of the Nabi of Allah. They left their post and they went headlong. As soon as they left their post, the Kuffar seen the unguarded pass and they launched an attack from the rear. They launched an attack from the rear. They penetrated the ranks. They got hold of...